Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Bridgeland, co-founder and CEO of More Perfect, and welcome to our briefing on trust in Georgia elections. Uh, first, an enthusiastic thanks to our partners, Nick Penniman of Issue One, Mindy Finn of Citizen Data, Don Gipps, Bruce Lowry, and Tim Carlberg at the Skoll Foundation, and all of their great teams. This briefing is the first in a series covering how the 2022 midterm elections influence trust in elections in the battleground states. And please get your questions ready by using the uh, question function on your technology. For those who don't know, More Perfect is an initiative of 11 presidential centers from Obama to Eisenhower, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Karsh Institute of Democracy at the University of Virginia, and more than 100 partners. The big idea is to advance five sustainable democracy goals, including free and fair elections, to align leaders and institutions around concrete goals and plans to meet them by 2026, the 250th anniversary of independence and beyond. The threats to our democracy have been urgent, and we can't miss a beat. Last summer, More Perfect launched Operation Restore Trust that provided targeted funding to partner organizations across five battleground states to educate and engage communities about the election process, how our elections work, the checks and balances to avoid error and fraud, and to promote the professionalism and patriotism of election workers. Our extraordinary partners at the Carter Center, Keep Our Republic and the People operated across Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia. Through a partnership with Citizen Data, we provided our partners with access to real-time voter data through their innovative new platform, Elect Protect. More Perfect and Team Democracy initiated a pledge that 775 candidates signed with an equal split of Republicans and Democrats agreeing to accept election results and the peaceful transfer of power. Special thanks to our partners, Ken Powley and General Stan McChrystal. Before I pass it over to Avery, I have to say that in public life, you occasionally see heroes, public officials who put our country before party, their oath to the constitution before self-interest and believe so strongly in our democratic norms, values and systems that they put everything on the line to defend them. It reminds me of that old movie line, aren't there some things worth losing everything for? These people, that's how they feel about America. This is true of Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and many other election officials across the country. And my good friend over 20 years, Ben Ginsburg, both of whom you'll, uh, you'll hear from today. Kennedy wrote Profiles in Courage. Someone should write Election Profiles in Courage and feature them. With that, I'll turn it over to Avery Davis Roberts from the Carter Center to talk about their work through Operation Restore Trust during the 2022 midterms in Georgia. And then she'll turn it over to Citizen Data's Mindy Finn to interview one of our very special guests. Avery. Thank you, Bridge. My name is Avery Davis Roberts, and I am an associate director in the democracy program at the Carter Center. And the Carter Center is delighted to have been able to contribute to Operation Restore Trust during this year's midterms and to be among the presidential partners of More Perfect and the Partnership for American Democracy. As we all know, Georgia was once again in the election spotlight this year. Given our deep Georgia roots, we at the Carter Center have tried to do what we can to support our election processes since we turned our attention from our international work to more U.S.-focused work in 2020. For the Carter Center, much of our work in the U.S. is really influenced by the more than 40 years of international experience that we have in conflict resolution and democracy and election support, and we have brought tools and resources that we have seen make a real difference in low trust electoral environments in other countries home to Georgia, including through the work that we did with Operation Restore Trust. This year through Operation Restore Trust, we focused on the provision of good and credible information about elections being shared through trusted messengers as a core component of our work. This has included voter education campaigns, materials that we shared with community networks, but that we also shared 
with under-resourced county election offices in all of Georgia's 159 counties and more than 400 public libraries that are dotted across the state. It also included the creation of the Georgia Democracy Resilience Network, a truly cross-partisan network of community leaders that are committed to having electoral processes that can be trusted and understood by all Georgians. And of course, it also included our work on the candidate principles for trusted elections, a sort of a sister project to the team democracy uh, effort that Bridge described. The five principles of the candidate principles are supported by individuals and candidates and organizations, and they lay out clearly what the majority of Americans expect from our candidates. And let me tell you, Georgia's candidates for statewide office led the way in demonstrating their commitment and leadership through support of these principles. Of course, our work are just pieces of all the work that has been done across the state to support trust in our elections this year, from election officials working many long days to run the November 8th election and then hustling over the Thanksgiving holidays to make it all work again on December 8th, to the many organizations like the ACLU, who you will hear from, and others who support the process through voter information and assistance and other efforts. There are certainly really good lessons to be learned, some of which will be touched on in the panel discussion, but of course, there is still so much more work to be done going forward to consolidate our gains. Before I turn over to Mindy Finn, the CEO of Citizen Data, I'd like to share a bit about today's briefing. So today, you'll hear from various experts on Georgia elections, really some of the best. I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation. You'll hear next from Citizen Data CEO Mindy Finn, who has her team's latest polling and research coming out of the midterm elections. She'll then be joined by Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger for a conversation on the state of Georgia elections. After that, we'll have a panel discussion moderated by Nick Penniman of Issue One, featuring Greg Bluestein, Andre Gillespie, Ben Ginsburg, and Andrea Young, experts who will address the issue of trust in Georgia's elections from a variety of vantage points, recognizing that the causes of mistrust are varied for different communities, and so too must be our responses if we are to continue to meet the moment. We'll end today's briefing with a few minutes for audience questions to the panel. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Citizen Data CEO, Mindy Finn. Thank you so much, Avery and Bridge, and it's such a pleasure to be here with all of you and this terrific team of partners. I, I'm gonna dive right in, as Avery said, to, to just some highlights of some recent research that Citizen Data engaged in in Georgia and in other key states across the country. So first of all, I just wanna be clear about something that we've found in our research. Uh, and this research comes at, from right after the election. This was conducted in November 17th to November 22nd time, time frame, that democracy and the protection of our elections were really on the ballot. I mean, it was top of mind for voters in this election when we gave voters 12 issues to, to look at and to pick their top three issues of concern, you can see that in Georgia, protecting elections was right up there near number three, number four top issue for voters, but specifically protecting elections from partisan attempts to overturn them. The other thing that we saw in this election, and this was true in Georgia, as well as across other states, is, is a greater prevalence of ticket splitting. So voters' behavior was, was impacted, and, and we have research to show that you know, while this isn't an explicitly political conversation, that democracy was top of mind and that really did impact voters' decisions and the ways that voters were behaving in this election. Among the issues that voters were concerned about, particularly those who were really making decisions, kind of putting country over party, prioritizing those who would protect our elections from partisan attempts to overturn them, we see that the concerns about spreading conspiracies or extremist views um, were, were, were some of those kind of key concerns. That's what was top of mind for them. Really the other piece that we have been very focused on, especially coming out of the 2020 election, is the proliferation of misinformation and disinformation around our elections. Um, we heard a lot from election officials, including those in Georgia, that they were suddenly feeling like that not only were they responsible for administering safe, secure, trusted elections, but they also were having to counter a lot of mis and disinformation that surrounds those elections. And so we have uh, invested at Citizen Data in a lot of work to really identify what are some of the best kind of research-backed, data-backed approaches 
to help build trust and to help educate voters uh, about really how elections are run so that they're not as susceptible to believing mistruths. Um, we tested a number of interventions, so the way that we frame communication around elections so that it could be actionable for election officials to use in their efforts and in for, for their offices to use as they would communicate uh, with voters around elections to build that trust. The pieces, and I don't worry, I will not read all of this to you, um, we really were interested in some key ways to approach combating disinformation that had risen to the top for us as we had surveyed voters and talked to voters in various places. And it was, does debunking conspiracy theories work um, or are there other approaches? And we we're particularly interested in this approach of helping voters really understand election officials and their role. Um, you know, election officials still are largely trusted. They're viewed in a positive light. It's important that they are the key figures and authorities of trust around elections. And so we found and, and we ended up testing and then found uh, really positive results for framing election officials in a positive light, showing that um, Georgia and election officials really are doing their jobs and helping people understand the role that those officials play and the oath that they take. The other thing that we wanted to look at was pairing that with negative framing of those who are spreading disinformation. Um, one thing that we found uh, is that by pairing those things, essentially communications that frames election officials in a positive light with the negative framing of disinformation sources, kind of the biases and the uh, pernicious intent of those who are trying to breed distrust, it was incredibly effective in moving the needle. Um, meaning that for those who saw such treatments, communication that paired those two components, they were much more likely to have faith trust and confidence in our elections writ large, as well as in their, their own vote. So this is just a brief overview of some of the research that has been conducted in Georgia that we have shared with Georgia election officials and, and across other states. And with that, I'm just incredibly honored and thrilled uh, to, to turn the conversation to a brief Q&A uh, with truly one of our election heroes, as Bridge said, Secretary of State Brad, Brad Raffensperger, of Georgia. Secretary, welcome to the program. Good afternoon. So we're so thrilled that you're you're with us here today. Um, I'm going to dive into a few questions. So what impact did the 2020 election challenges have on your planning for 2022 elections and how you're planning for future elections in Georgia? Well, in several respects, one of the, number one is we wanted to make sure that everyone felt it was open, uh, transparent, process and that we people had confidence in the results. That's why we did a uh, risk limiting audit of the November race, um, one of the races and we actually chose mine. But uh, we also, instead of just doing a 90% risk limit, we did 95%. And then we followed that up, we had a runoff. We also did a risk limiting audit of that race. So we could really give people the, the confidence that the machines did not flip the votes, they act recorded everyone's vote. Uh, we also, we looked at, we had, we had this record turnout for early voting. It was way much higher than we had in 2018 and even in 2020. And on election day, we had very strong turnout also. So from you boil it all down, people have lots of opportunities to vote. We want them to feel secure in the process. With the Election Integrity Act of 2021, we have photo ID for all forms of voting that included the absentee voting. And we think by using driver's license number and photo ID, it really enhanced security and people's confidence. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to build is confidence and trust in the system. And what are some of the key misconceptions that you see that voters have about the way elections are run that you have to deal with as Secretary of State? Well, many times they think that the Secretary of State's office is actually doing any tabulation. It starts at the precinct level, then they report those numbers up to the county. The county does all that collating for their entire county, and then they send that information to us. So that was probably just really basic uh, at that level. And then uh, the other thing is they people, uh, and after really what we saw in 2020, they said that there was thousands and thousands of dead people that voted. Uh, we joined the Electronic Registration Information Center. We have very clean voter rolls. We've actually been even recognized by Heritage as their top state for election integrity, which is on the left, on the right side of the aisle, I understand. But that would hopefully would show our voters' confidence that we have clean, accurate voter rolls. 
And so we want people to understand that Georgians are voting in this election, not people from other parts, not dead people, things like that. So, and I want to ask you about one of the uh, most joyful parts, I should say, of voting sometimes for a voter, which is that voter sticker that says, I voted in Georgia, I believe they would say, I voted and I'm a Georgia voter. This year, those stickers, uh, my understanding is said, I secured my vote. Uh, can you share the, the background behind that and, and kind of how that came to be and why that was important? Well, it really goes back to 2020. We already started that program about secure the vote uh, and secure uh, uh, vote Georgia. And we wanted people to feel comfortable about the whole process because in 2020 is when we stood up the verifiable paper ballot system. And people say, well, we need to go back to a paper ballot system. We do have a paper ballot system. What they're really, many people are saying um, that are activists, they wanna go back to hand counting. Uh, and that's really what they want. You know, hand marked paper ballots, they want hand counting. They don't want any technology in the process at all. But we have a verifiable paper ballot. You can verify your choices before you put it in the scanner. And then afterwards, we can do an audit of any race and verify that the machines are accurately recording your chosen you know, selections. That's terrific. So one of the other features of Georgia's elections is you have your general election in November, and then if a candidate fails to reach that 50% threshold, you have that runoff. Um, and obviously they just experienced the, the runoff for, for US Senate in Georgia. And after that, you, you did something interesting. You, you came out and you proposed doing away with that runoff election system and moving to, to more of an instant runoff election system. Um, can you share kind of why um, you're, you're thinking that would that would be better and what the prospects for that might be in Georgia? When we had the electronic voting and we had our four week runoff period uh, for state elections, it really didn't pose a problem because you didn't have a paper ballot. But now that we have risk limiting audits and then you then follow that up with a runoff four weeks later, it's just an awful lot of work for the counties. And that's coming right in around the Thanksgiving holiday. So some people say, well, let's go back to the nine week runoff period. Well, then that's gonna brush right up into Christmas, your Hanukkah and New Year's. So it also brushing up against a lot, a lot of holidays. And I think if you really you know, poll voters, what they would say is, why can't we just get rid of, why are we one of the only states that have general election runoffs? Why can't we just do that away? So. I said that this time that we look at that, I call the General Assembly, that there's lots of options out there. They need to go through and do the process and really decide what they want this to look like going forward. At the end of the day, our office is gonna follow whatever is enacted. We follow the law and we follow the constitution, but we believe that uh, voters and the election directors and election workers think it's time to move away from having a runoff system in Georgia. Thank you, Secretary. Uh as you look to, to future elections, let's see, you know, 2024, kind of around the, the horizon, on the horizon, um, beyond changing, moving away from the runoff system to an instant runoff, what are, are there other major changes or, or innovations that, that you think would, would benefit Georgia voters? We've really uh, have just a few, we, we, did, we did additional investigators for one thing. We don't have enough. If you look at how many hundreds of investigations we open, and we really like to be able to invest, investigate those more timely so that we can get those before the state election board to get resolution of those. That would be one thing. But by and large, we have 17 days of early voting. What we're seeing now is about 65% of all Georgia voters are voting early, about 30% on election day, and about 5% you know, with absentee. We have photo ID for all forms of voting. So we think that we're in a pretty good spot right there. Uh, if we do away with runoffs, then I think that uh, takes you know that off the table. Uh, then we also would like to see the General Assembly actually you know put into law that additional uh, risk limiting audits to give voters confidence, not just for a statewide race, but also looking at some state Senate, state house selected ones. We make it very randomized but that we can give voters that confidence that their vote counts has been counted accurately and these are the true results. We think that would be something because when we asked for doing a runoff for the, uh, we asked for doing an audit during the runoff, some of the counties said, we're, you know, it kind of showed you the how tired they were, but about 30 to 40 of the counties said, you know, we just don't have the bandwidth for that. And we think that's something that we should put in there that, you know, every election does have some sort of risk limiting on it. Um, thank you. 
And so this kind of my my last question, you know, you were among the first candidate to sign the Carter Center's candidate principles for for trusted elections. And, you know, this really built on you know, the decisions that you made in 2020 to, to put principle first and kind of country over party when you were facing immense pressure and, and perhaps taking a pretty you know, political risk in deciding to to put your job kind of over partisanship. Um, what what is it that drove you to 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 make that decision? You know, we we kind of hope that all officials in your position would make a similar decision, but that's not always the case. You know, what what was it that kind of gave you the the courage and the strength to do so? Well, I understood that if I'm going to put my uh, name, you know, out there uh, on the ballot. I know how the process works and I have an awful lot of confidence in it. And then I was going to abide by whatever the results were. were. Was I going to win? Was I going to lose? Or was I going to be another runoff like I've been in four other times before? Whatever that case was, I was going to accept the will of the people. Yes, if you're a candidate and the race is extremely you know, close, within a half percent, you can ask for a recount. That's established in state law. But this uh, needless confrontation, this needless uh, you know, getting a lawyers and fighting this when the facts show that you have lost is just very, uh, it's, it just really disturbs the, the public peace. People are tired of all this consternation, all the screaming and hollering. They'd like to just move on. And I figure, you know, if the cook won't eat his own cooking, then you can't really trust the cook. So here we are. I'm the chief election official. I trust their elections. And that was my way of saying, I trust what we do here in Georgia. And I think our audit of both races have shown that we have fair, honest, and accurate elections in Georgia. Yeah, amen. Thank you so much, Secretary, for what you do for Georgia and what you have done for the country. And thank you for joining us here today um, and taking the time. This was incredibly valuable, and we'll be all here, you know, supporting you as as much as as much as we can as we head in, into next elections. Thank you for your time. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Nick Penniman, founder and CEO of Issue One, to, to bring in and introduce our panel. Nick. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Bridge. Thank you all for attending. And I think that I think that Secretary Raffensperger is going to stick with us on this panel as long as he can. Um, but you can see who else is joining us. Andrea Young, the executive director of the ACLU of Georgia. Ben Ginsburg, the co-chair of the Election Official Legal Defense Network. Andra Gillespie, the Associate Professor of Political Science at Emory, and then Greg Bluestein, a Senior Political Reporter with the Atlanta Journal Constitution. So maybe if we can pull the panel screen down for a sec, and get everyone on the. Just want to start out by asking you all um, uh, one question, which is what surprised you most about this election cycle that's influencing how you're thinking about issues and trust in elections as we move forward towards the 2024 cycle. So let's start with um, let's start with Andrea. The um, hi everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being a part of this important discussion. Um, I would say I was not especially surprised by what happened this cycle, and I think um, particularly the impact of the changes. Uh, on the ability to vote by mail um, was dramatic. And so, you know, we'll be looking at going forward how um, how that can be, how that can be addressed. Um, you know, there the 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 battle in Georgia for, you know, has also been, has been about access to the ballot, especially for African Americans and, and other people of color. And so the, the the trust question is a little different than you know is is there integrity in the election? It is will I will I have access to voting? Will voting be something that um, that will be easy for me? Given that you know Georgia has a hospitality economy, you know our folks work you know twelve hours a day, you know they work weekends. Uh, people travel for work. Uh, and so as we saw in 2020, the ease of voting by mail was really, really important in, in increasing uh, voter participation. And we lost a lot of that uh, in rule changes and, and laws that were changed after uh, the 2020 election. Um, so I, I, I think, unfortunately, uh, things played out a little bit the way I anticipated you know, we had a million fewer voters in 2022 than we did in 2020. 
Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, but I wouldn't expect that the drop would have been as dramatic. Um, but I think the rule changes um, were um, were impactful uh, in in accomplishing that. Andrea, just quickly on the on the drop. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of that can be attributed to a midterm. Mm -hmm. Was it? But how was turnout compared to the twenty eighteen or the twenty fourteen? Well, final numbers, you know, were comparable. But you have to also remember that Georgia is a growing state, and so there are about three hundred thousand more uh, registered voters uh, than at that time. Um, and we're, you know, the, the other goal is, are we accepting uh, the low turnout rates that we have in this country? Uh, or are we looking for tools that allow more people to participate in the process? And I think, you know, Secretary Raffensperger in 2020 actually put together a really robust set of tools to promote access to Georgians from every walk of life. And you saw people take advantage of that uh, opportunity. Uh, and there were fewer opportunities. Um, the rules didn't just go back to 2020 uh, or, or to 2018. The rules after uh, the rules that were in place for the 2022 election were uh, much more challenging to access voter uh, vote, vote by mail than they had been in 2018. So I think actually the use of vote by mail uh, in 2022 was actually lower um, than in 2018. Let's go with the same question to Ben, and then we'll do Andra and then Greg. So Ben, what surprised you or interested you most about this cycle that is affecting the way you're thinking about 24? Uh, it's a great question, Nick. I think what surprised me the most, or is what, what's most noteworthy, is that election denialism as a strategy for Republican candidates in battleground states failed. Secretary Raffensperger, uh, showed that you did not need that strategy to win. Uh, and in fact, around the country in contested battleground states, uh, election denialism was not a successful strategy. But on the other hand, there was not an incumbent who, who embraced election denialism who was defeated. And so incumbents uh, managed to win elections. And I think what we saw is that while it didn't uh, election denialism did not work as a national strategy in contested races. There are still any number of election deniers who won on county, uh, on the county level in contested states and certainly in non-contested states. So in looking at 2024 uh, and 2022, I think you can say the fever may have broke in 2022 but the virus is still out there in the body politic, and there are mutations that are possible for 2024. Andra? Sorry, I forgot I was muted. Um, I'm going to agree with Ben a little bit. I actually use the metaphor a little bit differently. I would say that the fever has gone from about 104 to 102, so it's still really serious. And 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 so I I see the 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 positive trend, but I don't necessarily think that we're out of the woods just yet. And that certainly is something that you, I think we need to be vigilant about as we go forward. I am and that wasn't surprised by anything that we saw in terms of uh, what the election results look like, um, or even some of the things that we saw in terms of turn out. Um, I think that there are some lessons that I see that I do want to take away from this as we think ahead to not only the 2024 cycle, but just future cycles in general. Um, and so one of the things that I'm very interested in, and, 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 and COVID kind of confounds this a little bit, so it's always going to be hard to tell, um, but what I see is increasing acceptance and reliance in the electorate upon um, early voting, whether that's absentee or whether that's in person. Um, there just seems to be greater popularity in engaging in early voting. And in uh, my own data collection where I survey voters in Georgia, I asked like why they were doing it. And the predominant reasons tended to be, I made up my mind already and it was most convenient for me. So I think voters are expressing their preferences with their feet and with their behavior. Um, and policymakers should pay attention to that, particularly if anybody wants to bring uh, a 
um, you know, any bill that's going to uh, further curtail early voting in the state. This has become increasingly popular, and it's pretty much a habit for people at this point. And so I think you're going to actually encounter a lot of resistance to that, both on the Democratic and the Republican side, because it's not like Republicans didn't vote early either, even though Democrats are more likely to do it. Um, you know, I think the other, you know, really important takeaway um, from uh, this election cycle is, you know, I paid attention to minority voter turnout. And so compared to 2018, my colleague Bernard Frog has um, already like crunched the data for the November election, we saw lower voter turnout in black and brown communities. Um, and it was particularly bad in brown communities. Um, I think we can explore the possibilities of suppression there, but I think we also have to put equal weight on voter mobilization. And so one of the things that's actually really interesting is that if we compare runoff turnout sort of for Blacks in particular as a proportion of the electorate um, in early voting uh, in the 2021 runoff compared to the 2020 general, and then in this last uh, runoff compared to uh, November's midterm election, we see this increase in activity and this ability to get Black people to turn out in the clutch for a runoff election. And so we have to ask ourselves, if you can get Black people to turn out in December or in January for an election, why can't this happen in November? Um, that might actually, in some instances, be determinative of, of like having, having us avoid runoffs in the first place. And so that suggests that there's a lot that organizations can do to pay attention to elections the first time around when more people are going to participate in the election than having to kind of wait and sort of act out of desperation to get Blacks to turn out to vote. And I think that this is actually one of the things that actually underscores a lot of activist kind of frustration uh, with partisan politics that says that you only come around when you need me and you're not actually fully engaging. And so I think that's a really sobering lesson. Just a follow-up question before we go to Greg. Um, Andre, one of the one of the kind of notions of early voting for a long time has been that it is favorable to um, working class voters, blue collar voters, voters who can't just you know take a half day off or three hours off to go vote. Is there data in Georgia that shows that that's the case? That as Georgia's expanded early voting, that portion of the electorate is expanding. So that I don't have access to. I could look into it. We'd have to get sort of a survey, not survey data, but marketing data from uh, Catalyst and other sources in order to be able to determine class. Just looking at the regular voter file, we know age, we know race, we know gender. Um, and so one of the things that we can see sort of in the early voting data in particular is that you see spikes in African-American turnout on the weekends, right? And so we know that, you know, souls to the polls was a thing uh, that was institutionalized long ago. We know that there are congregations that are very much in the practice of, of, of taking their, their parishioners straight to the voting polls after a Sunday service. The weekend evidence suggests that this is something that is in fact working, but I don't, like I can't look at, at the voter file data and necessarily deduce a person's class status as a result of it. But that's a good question um, that we can figure out and, and, and look at later. Cool, great. Greg? If I had one big surprise of this election cycle, it was the depth and breadth of of pushback on the election deniers in the state. Um, I know Georgia might be an anomaly when compared to some other states, but uh, if you asked me a year ago at this time, after around this time, David Perdue got in the race, around this time, Stacey Abrams got in the race for governor against Brian Kemp. And the smart money was kind of on a 50-50 shot of Governor Kemp even making it out of the primary against David Perdue with Donald Trump's endorsement going against him. Um, and of course, David Perdue, the, the former US Senator, ran on a pro-Trump platform that pretty much revolved around um, his adherence to election fraud lies. And he said, and the, from the get-go, he wouldn't have, ver uh, have uh, verified the election. He wouldn't have uh, verified the 2020 election. Um, he, would, he would have basically promoted Donald Trump's falsehoods and conspiracy theories and the like. And in the end, Governor Kemp beats him by 52 points. And not just Brian Kemp, um, he was far from the only Republican incumbent who beat back Donald Trump back challengers. You had Secretary of State Rod Raffensperger beating back Jody Heiss. You had the Attorney General Chris Carr winning. You had even had the John King, the insurance commissioner, beating a Trump back challenger who said that he supported woke insurance policies, whatever that means. Um, and so we saw, um, you know, sort of a deep commitment. Um, and I know Republicans sometimes write that off as Democratic crossover votes, and there certainly were some Democratic crossover votes. But there is a significant portion of Republican voters who came out in droves to also back um, those Republican incumbents against Trump back challengers. And so, again, Georgia might be the, the sort of standout when it comes to that, because we've seen in other states 
how Trump's endorsement elevated, you know, kind of second tier candidates into into front runner status. But in Georgia, at least when it comes to incumbents, uh, we you know those incumbents beat back those challenges. So we we had that that sort of Trump uh, election um, trutherism, that same strain. It's certainly in Georgia, and as many of the speakers have already said, that that fever has not yet broken. Trust me, I've gone to events <laughs> that Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, sponsored where people are wearing pink shirts to say Trump won. Um, that has not gone away by any means. Um, but my surprise of the cycle was the, the I thought Brian Kemp would win. Um, I did not think he'd win by 52 points. So the level of rejection of that, of that, that strain of, of, of Trump trutherism was got to be my surprise. Mm -hmm. By the way, to the audience, um, we're going to spend the last 10 minutes or so taking questions from the audience. So there's a Q&A function um, down at the bottom of your screen. If you want to start piling questions in there now, that would be great. Um, Andrea, uh, you know, the big elections bill was passed after the 2020 election in anticipation of 2022. It was a big fight in the state. Big corporations got involved. Lots of people got involved. It was kind of a national spectacle in many ways. Do you expect that legislative activity around elections had died down for now in the state of Georgia? Is that kind of the last bill that will pass for a while? Or are you anticipating more legislation in the wake of the 2022 cycle? Well, uh, Secretary Raffensperger has already called for doing away with the, um, with the general election runoff. Um, there may be some discussions around that. There is a... Um, you know, I don't, you know, our our issue is always around uh, making sure that, you know, every citizen can vote and it's easy and every vote is counted. So we're, you know, we are nonpartisan. We do, of course, have a particular concern about the access to the ballot for African-Americans who historically have been targets of disenfranchisement. Um, and, and many of those, um, you know, concerns still persist. We, of course, believe that there is there you you can't separate race from election denialism, and so much of the discussion about where um, where you know inappropriate votes are coming from seem to be targeted on areas that have lots of black voters, um, and so um, so that's certainly always a, a concern. We would you know we will. You know, I would think that, um, you know, enough is enough, but, you know, you can, um, and we have a very different legislature, legislative landscape right now. We have a new speaker, we have a new, uh, you know, leader of the Senate. And so there are a lot of inexperienced, a lot of experienced people have gone from the legislature. So it's gonna be an interesting um, uh, thing. I think, you know, it will depend also on whether or not Governor Kemp wants some changes. He did win in a very, he had a very strong showing. Um, and I think that uh, folks in the legislature will follow his lead on whether or not, um, whether or not he thinks there should be any additional, any additional changes. Mm -hmm. ben, ben, I want you to speak to something really specific for a second. So Eric, the electronic registration, um, it's, it's a multi-state thing that I believe the Pew Center set up years ago. It's a way for states to share data about voters. It, it seems as if both sides should like it, um, you know, uh, especially folks who are kind of conspiratorially minded should like it because it's a great way to figure out if dead people are voting or not, right? Or if out-of-state people are voting or not. And yet it's become incredibly contentious in MAGA circles. And there's pressure on the um, red leaning states that participate in ERIC to completely pull out of it. Why is that? And why don't we have a national, a mandatory national voter registry system that all the states can participate in? A great and confounding um, question. ERIC really um, provides the ability for states to check on the eligibility of their voters. In other words, voters move out of state in the United States. Eric is a way to cross-reference that to be sure people are not registered and certainly not registered in voting in more than one state. Um, I think you put your finger on the somewhat illogical reason why it's run into so much trouble. 
which is it was started by Pew and is perceived as something that is too intrusive and basically a plot by the left against the right side. I mean, again, I think if you if you drill down into the reasons that the red states are giving for wanting to um, to pull back out of there, it's completely illogical. But it is part of the the extreme polarization and division. And are you wearing a red shirt or a blue shirt that we see in the country? So it doesn't make any sense. Uh, in, in, if you really do want a secure election system without double voting, uh, and the opposition to it is based more on sort of gut emotion than uh, logical reason. Andrew, go, just going back to um, what Greg said about um, his surprise about Kemp winning by what percent, uh, you've written a lot about candidate quality and how that affects turnout. To what extent can we be begin to link candidate quality with those who are embracing conspiracy theories? You know, if you look at the polling that Mindy presented earlier, con the American public does not like conspiracy theorists. Now, first of all, they've got to know that that person act that there is a conspiracy, that it is a lie, not the truth, and that person's embracing it. But at what point do you think we can begin to definitively say that there is a direct link between those who embrace conspiracy and candidate quality themselves. I mean, it certainly seems anecdotally like there was a pretty clear link in this cycle with a lot of the candidates who were conspiracy theorists. And as Greg said, they got shot down. Um, but I wonder if moving forward, if that just becomes, uh, there's a direct correlation between the two. Well, I mean, I think that this is a larger issue about what constitutes candidate quality and candidate quality is multifaceted. Um, and so what we saw was that new candidates who were coming forward who were running for offices that they didn't currently hold or had held before were disadvantaged by the connections to Trump, disadvantaged by the embrace of the conspiracy theories. But incumbents who were embracing the conspiracies, sometimes because they were true believers, sometimes because it was a means to an end, had other things to offset the problems and of the optics of them embracing the lie. So, you know, that is longstanding sort of, you know, tenure in the seat, uh, the ability to fundraise, high name recognition, um, the records that they could run on, um, the uh, kind of congruence with the overall district overall, like these are all other factors that, uh, you know, are actually working in concert with the, you know, identification with Trump and the MAGA wing of the Republican Party. So there has to be a larger kind of conversation about moral authority and whether or not somebody ceded their moral Moral authority by embracing the lie, particularly if it's very clear that they probably really don't believe this and they're just pandering um, to a particular constituency. But the other issues related to candidate quality, you know, were not just that Trump picked people who were, you know, full-fledged believers, uh, you know, in the idea that he uh, that the election was stolen from them, but also they were inexperienced, they had baggage, um, they didn't necessarily seem to grasp a command of the issues. All of those other things mattered too. So so it wasn't just the embrace of the big lie that ends up repudiating them. It was just that these folks were terrible candidates. And I think it should also be and you know pointed out that Trump endorsed a lot of, of incumbents who didn't need his endorsement because they had all this experience and money and name recognition. And he just did that to kind of like you know pad his record because there were places where he was faltering and where his decisions didn't quite follow sort of traditional forms of logic or strategy. Um, and, and it just seemed to be either pretty random or based on personal loyalty to him or his idea that anybody who has a successful like, you know, TV presence can then also be a politician. Yeah. Greg, I'd love for you to just muse for a second on the information environment that, that you work in now versus when you entered the industry. Now, you don't look terribly old, but you, you've probably been a journalist for at least 10 years, I, I would imagine. I mean, everything shifted really fast, right? Um, yeah. The collapse of trust in the institution of journalism in general, the rise of Twitter and Facebook, the you know flooding of the zone with, remember what we all know what Steve Bannon called it, the S word. Um, you know, the, the environment that you're working in has changed tremendously. I think people, especially younger people, often forget that if folks like you get it wrong repeatedly, like if you mess up your stories one time, you probably can keep your job twice, probably not, three times, certainly not, you're fired. Um, and so 
it, you know, when, when you look at kind of trusted information out there, it's unfortunate, of course, that people keep turning away from reputable papers like yours, one of the best in the country, um, and two, specious sources to what their neighbors are saying on Facebook, what their crazy cousin's saying on Twitter. Um, so how do you, how do you, when you wake up and think about operating in that information environment, what, what do you do? What, what's your kind of the fight that you have to fight? Yeah, it's such a good question. And, and yeah, I've been doing this for 20 years now, which is crazy to think about. But, um, you know, as one of my, my, my famed journalism professors, Conrad Fink, uh, the late great Conrad Fink said at University of Georgia 20 years ago, the uh, journalism is that strange field where you don't need a certificate, you don't need a diploma, you don't need a advanced degree, you just need credibility. And really, what you really need is one editor saying you're a journalist. And so the best thing you've got going for you is that credibility. And it can be you can go, go like that. Um, one of the things we've learned and one of the things that we wake up now, um, knowing that it's so important, is that A, covering election law changes, covering voting is a full-time beat now. We have a we have a reporter on our staff, Mark Nisi, who only covers, uh, or not only, but primarily covers voting changes. Um, and it, you know, it's it's even more important right now than it is right before an election, because right now the nation's attention, the world's attention is focused on other things, it's not focused squarely on Georgia like it was in the run-up to the runoff. Um, but this is when um, this is when it's more important than ever, because this is when, as we mentioned earlier, this program, there's about to be all sorts of legislative proposals involving Georgia's election law, and not just runoffs. I think there'll be all sorts of proposals to curtail early voting. I don't know if they'll get anywhere. Uh, and then of course, there's also going to be a debate about changing the schedule for Georgia's uh, presidential primary that will uh, well, the Democrats want, but will also mm -hmm. open up that really core uh, code section to invite other changes that we'll be watching vigilantly. And I know that people on this call will be watching it vigilantly as well. But, you know, one thing that we've definitely seen happen um, really since 2016, but particularly hastened since 2020, is journalists have taken their vigilance up a notch and are using plain language to describe what's happening. Um, you know, we use the phrase election fraud lies, phony conspiracy theories. Uh, we use lies routinely. And we used to be more... Um, a lot more hesitant about using that, mm -hmm. but we're calling things as we see them, which is a lie is a lie. Um, you know, one thing that we did at the AJC that other outlets have done as well is we documented in painstaking details the extent of Trump and his allies' attempt to overturn the election here in Georgia and new efforts to undermine the vote in 2022. Just as I mentioned earlier, me going to different events all around the state where people wear Trump won shirts, you know, and and not necessarily amplifying those lies, but trying to find a way to report those while also debunking um, or, or at least trying to demystify those conspiracy theories at the same time. My wake up call personally was after Trump lost three days, uh, two or three days after the the election in November of 2020, going to a stop the steal as, as the as the Trump allies would call it rally. Um, that wasn't just some fringe elements of the Republican Party. These, the Republican Party chairman was there, um, and other mainstays of 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 the Republican establishment were there. And then, not long afterwards, going to an event that was headlined by uh, Lynn Wood, who is a now infamous Trump conspiracist theory, theorist. Uh, you know, I thought there'd be it was in suburban Atlanta. I thought there'd be just a couple handful of, you know, a couple hundred people there. There's more than 1500 people there and I couldn't find a parking space. That was my holy crap moment in that sense um, that, hey, you know, this is this is taking deep root. And it's not just a few conspiracy theorists out there. There are people who who, you know, who are mainstays in the metro Atlanta and the Georgia community. Mm -hmm. um, so we devoted tremendous, tremendous resources to covering the fallout of these lies, how they impacted the election. And the most of the core election deniers lost their races, as we mentioned earlier, it's going to continue to be a theme because there's going to be legislative proposals that that hinge on those conspiracy theories. Uh, and it's also a topic, as we've learned, that devotes and demands full-time coverage, particularly, as I said, when there's no election you know, looming over us right now, off an off-year election. This is, I think, when the most significant action takes place. Take today as an example. I mean, even today. Um, we've had uh, Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State, write on that Wall Street Journal op-ed calling uh, Senator Warnock an, a, an election denier, and we heard Senator Warnock respond to that on CBS National News. So if we had any, any doubt about whether Georgia would kind of remain at the pivot point, the centerpiece, the focal of the voting rights debate in Georgia, today should dispel that notion. Well, that kind of brings up the the motherload question in my mind, which is, um, 
been submitted by one of our audience members. And I think I'll start with Ben on this one, because Ben, you've been watching involved in elections and watching elections for so long, which is what will it take to not only break the fever of election denialism, but kill the virus that causes it? Um, I'd love for you to just talk about that, because I, I remember Romney um, came out pretty quickly after Trump started putting out the big lie. And he said he was asked, what do you need to do to you know, stop the big lie? He said, just deny it. Say that say who legitimately won the election. And, and Romney, as we all recall, was one of the first Republicans to come out and say that Biden legitimately won the election. So that's obviously one thing. But Ben, there's probably a whole formula in your head of other things. And I'd love for everyone to um, chip in in addition to Ben. Um, sure. Well, look, um, I think I think, first of all, you have to recognize that election denialism, even if it didn't work in the general election, is kind of the ante to get into a Republican primary again. And so ultimately, I think the only way you rid the virus from the body politic is the voter, that it has to be an unsuccessful election strategy. And I think um, if you talk to the comparative democracists who like actually study what's happened in other countries, they will tell you that there are two crucial groups to getting the voters into that position of kicking out the election denial. Um, number one is the leadership of the Republican Party. Uh, look, I, I, I'm a lifelong Republican. I'm still a Republican. Uh, I, I think it is a dereliction of duty to allow this to go on. And, and frankly, the ramifications of it are being felt by, by just looking at the leadership elections of Republicans in the U.S. House and, and Senate. And it's sort of a dysfunctional uh, system. The other group that globally does a lot to sort of put the tooth, toothpaste back in the tube is the business community. And the business community um, steps up episodically and sort of inconsistently and not as a group, uh, but the business community is, is extremely important. And then lastly, I think that the solution it, to, to this is going to come much more on a local level than a national level. I think the national level is sort of um, fatally poisonous, but people in the community across the political spectrum want their own communities to work and be peaceful. That's good for families, it's good for businesses, it's good for everything. And so uh, uh, I, I think that getting the leaders of the community, we call it the pillars of the community, the election officials legal defense network, um, to get to know the elections official, be able to, to open up the hood of the election system, get all their questions answered, understand the safeguards that are in it, uh, and then basically form a group that provides credibility to the outcome of elections because they know the system works. Not who wins or loses a close election, but rather knowing that the system itself works. So I do those four things to try and um, to try and, and deal with the problem of election denial. Let's go to Andra, then Andrea, then Greg, to see if you have anything to add to that formula. Sure, I, I, I agree uh, with Ben. Part of the reason why we're in the problem that we're in is that institutionally, 50 years ago, we moved away from uh, strong partisan control or stronger partisan control to candidate-centered politics. And this candidate-centered politics allows for the emergence of, of, of people like Donald Trump who could cultivate a, a cult following, but it also means that the party is weaker to be able to stop this kind of um, activity. And so uh, I think there's a case to be made here for strengthening the party apparatus and allowing elites to be able to have greater filtering and winnowing ability um, so that they can uh, try to keep extremist candidates out but that's also going to take the will of, 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 of party elites to stand up to their followers at some point. Um, and so what we see is a party that's being hijacked by a, 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 a large portion um, of their electorate. Um, and what we see is people pandering to them as opposed to actually leading them and trying to sort of like uh, bring them in the direction of truth. And they're doing so in part because people are afraid of losing whatever position or power they have now. Um, and so I just see a big collective action problem going on here where there are people who know better who could band together 
who could be willing to take some losses, some casualties in terms of political office in order to stand up for the truth, but very few refuse to do so. And so as a result, this is uh, being able to continue to, to metastasize with the virus is, 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 is spreading um, as you will. So I think when we see that type of, of courageous leadership, both at the local and the national level, where people are actually willing to stand up and say the emperor has no clothes and the sky really is blue, um, we may be in a different a different setting. But, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we we need stronger parties. And I think like sort of this current era is evidence of the fact that we don't necessarily want to go back to smoke filled rooms, but like they served a purpose. And so if we could figure out how to do that without the corruption, we would be in a much better place. Hmm. Andrea? Yeah, I, I think that all of the uh, players in the civic space have got to be vocal about being committed to a multiracial, multicultural democracy. Um, if we don't have a multicultural democracy, we don't have a democracy. And I think we've not really affirmed that, you know, in the South, you know, we had voting and uh, Black people were excluded from it. Uh, and that was not democracy. Uh, and so I think we really have to talk about how important it is that we embrace, you know, this diversity. I like to say in Georgia, when I'm talking to members of the legislature, you know, you can't have the prosperity without the diversity. What has made Georgia, Metro Atlanta, the dynamic um, uh, economic engine that it is has been the, the, the diversity and the inclusion and the commitment uh, to creating welcoming spaces for people from, you know, from everywhere in the country, everywhere in the world, every religion, race, and so forth. Uh, and so that really is Georgia's real secret formula for the kind of prosperity that we have. Um, and I think there is a kind of denialism um, that diversity is our strength uh, and that it makes, it's making our, um, our democracy stronger. Um, and, you know, and, and that really all kinds of civic participants uh, really speak up for that. I think we saw in 2020 that the corporate sector in Atlanta, um, the sports sector really stepped up to be supportive of access to the ballot. They opened up State Farm Arena and Mercedes-Benz Stadium, you know, to, to make elections safe uh, in the midst of COVID. And so that some of that kind of commitment is continued that people give, you know, their um, employees the day off to be election workers um, so that we're able to broaden and have more tech savvy, younger people participate participating as poll workers. Um, and so I think that that kind of corporate commitment also to supporting the infrastructure of our elections uh, is also something that, um, that needs to expand and become uh, something that is uh, expected and not just something we do in emergencies. Greg, final word? Yeah, from my, from my media perspective, uh, I think we in the journalism business have to continue to use more plain spoken language, calling out yeah. lies when they're lies, reporting the facts, detailing in-depth uh, efforts to subvert election results, change election laws. And we of course also need to continue to be careful about amplifying conspiracy theories, even when we're batting them down. We haven't found out the per perfect formula for that, but we tried, mm -hmm. what we call it the truth sandwich, a truth, the lie, the truth to remind readers of that. It's not perfect, but it's one way we can do that. I tend to try to be really conservative on social media, even when I'm amplifying, you know, even when I see a ridiculous lie, even when you're quote tweeting it and saying how ridiculous it is, you're still repeating that underlying lie. So I, I tend to personally try to be very careful about that. And then my takeaway too, on a more global perspective is that politicians, advocates, journalists, whoever, we're, we, we need to be far more vigilant even about minor changes to election law and that there's more pressure uh, on candidates and outside groups, the parties to educate voters about these laws than ever before. And that takes tremendous resources. That takes away from a candidate or a campaign's resources that even when we see these record amounts being spent, they're not all just being spent on TV ads and getting out the vote. A lot of that money is now being spent on just telling voters about the changes. Um, and when we talk about these changes, a perfect example was the saga over Saturday voting before the runoff this cycle. Because, you know, in all the debate about Georgia's law in 2021, that change hardly came up. I might be missing it, but I, I covered a lot of that. And I don't really remember that really coming up in a prominent factor. And of course, it exploded into the forefront this session. From what I understand, that law was apparently designed to help local elections officials avoid working on the July 4th weekend um, if there was a, a runoff over the summer. Um, but those laws can have 
have consequences that might be unintended, that might be intended, uh, depending on how you view things. Um, and of course, that became a, such a big part of this nationally watched runoff that we just finished. And I think it's going to continue to take a concerted effort from media, from advocates, from campaigns, from outside groups to keep Georgians and others informed on how these, these election laws uh, impact them, because we saw that in a very large degree this past runoff cycle. All right, folks, we're one minute over. Um, you guys have been fantastic panelists. Great to see uh, Secretary Raffensperger, Mindy, John Bridgeland. Um, thank you all for attending. There were lots of great questions in the Q&A that we couldn't get to. So I'm sure that we will try to do something or that uh, the more perfect crew will try to do something like this in the future. So have great days and happy holidays to everyone. See you later. <laughs>